Welcome. I'm Melinda Baird, Director of Education and Community Outreach for Steinway and Sons in Washington, DC. I'm coming to you again today from my home with my own Steinway here in Bethesda, Maryland, where we are sequestered together, my piano and me. And I'm happy to welcome all of our listeners and viewers, and especially our distinguished panelists, to this third session of our pandemic pedagogy series for Steinway. We have four fantastic concert pianists and educators who will share their experiences today in overcoming obstacles as musicians of color <laughs> and educate us on ways we can increase diversity in classical music. This has been a great education for me so far. I have learned so much as I talk to each of these panelists independently, and I think we're in for a great uh, education today in this hour that we spend together. So I would first like to welcome Dr. David Berry, who is chair of the music department at Eastern Mennonite University in Harris, uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. We also have uh, with us Professor Paul Bratcher, who is Director of Jazz Studies at Georgetown University. He's also on the piano faculty at Levine Music and chairs Levine's Southeast Campus at the ARC in Anacostia. Welcome, <coughs> Paul. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to a great discussion. Good to have you with us. Uh, we are so honored to have with us today <laughs> Professor Malani Perez, who is a Steinway artist and a longtime faculty member at George Washington University here in Washington, DC. Welcome, Malani. Thank you very much. An honor to be here. I'm delighted to meet all my colleagues. Thank you for asking me. So, uh, so wonderful to have you with us. Uh, and last but not least, coming to us from the sunny island of Puerto Rico is Jose <laughs> Ramos Santana. Uh, Jose is on the faculty of Catholic Hi, University in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's also artist faculty of the International Keyboard Institute and piano faculty member of Levine Music. Welcome, Jose. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with all of you and uh, so glad to share with all my distinguished colleagues this, this <laughs> I think it's going to be a great discussion, and yes. we uh, are especially welcome you, our listeners. In addition, we would love to hear from you. You can submit questions to our panel through the Zoom Q&A feature or in the chat. You can also view this session, which is being recorded on our Facebook page and uh, Steinway YouTube channel, and you can see the previous sessions of our pandemic pedagogy. So let's get right to it. We have so many interesting things to cover. Malini, let's start with you. Can you take <laughs> us back to uh, what things were like in the early days of your career? You have a long and distinguished career and you've been performing uh, since the 60s, I believe. Is that right? Earlier than that. Earlier than, than that. Debut recital when I was 12 and that makes it to 1929 when I was born, but then 42, I guess, something like that. I'm 91 now, so it's, it's almost a century of, of music. <laughs> and no, it, it was very interesting those days because for one thing, I had a triple whammy uh, in that I was uh, not only a woman of color, but a woman and there were no women pianists or women musicians at that time. I remember two, Eileen Joyce and Myra Hess. Myra Hess was a wonderful yeah. pianist. And there were no others in Europe. I was playing in Europe. And also I came from the wrong continent to play Beethoven, Bach and Chopin and Rachmaninoff. Now they expected me, most of my managements, uh, to, uh, to perhaps, they asked me, don't you dance? And I said, no, I don't dance, I've learned how. I play the piano. So I had to prove myself at every concert and every review, and we had press reviews those days because the newspapers were functioning real well. And every review mattered for the next uh, lot of concerts I could get. So it was very competitive from that point of view. I felt I was on trial every concert. I, I was, uh, I had to prove myself, which now looking back at 91, 
I feel it's a pity because I now enjoy playing with no competition, just for the gratitude, for the just the pleasure, and I just to thank the universe for the gift of music, a language without boundaries, a ling language which speaks to the souls with no impediment of words. And I just play every day thanking God for this. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We have that great gift of music and what a blessing it's been for you to be able to share it uh, for such a long period of your life. Do you think things have changed in the way you are received as a performer? Oh, yes. I mean, I don't, I don't feel that I'm on trial. I feel I can play the piano um, on an even more even footing. And I don't, <clears throat> people don't look at me and say, why is she playing the piano at all? <clears throat> this, uh, I think, uh, was a great uh, impediment in that I felt, I felt the urge to be competitive, which I don't think is really necessary. I now, I, I feel that if I just, I feel the people have the opportunity more than I did <clears throat> in my time to express themselves and to just be, this is what I can offer you and please accept it. And people do now, much more than they did, because uh, you, I didn't tell you various stories, but one story is that I also did some singing. And Joan Sutherland and I were scholars together at the Royal College of Music on the Associated Board Scholar. But my opera teacher told me, who was the same as Joan's, uh, you can't make a go of opera. There are no parts written for you. All you can ever sing is Lakme from By the Leaves because that's the only thing that a woman of your color can sing. And that was in the 1950s. We have gone so far. Yeah. So far, it's unimaginable. We can sing anywhere, any part. That's marvelous. I yeah. just applaud that. I'm so grateful. That's that wonderful. Was, I'm grateful for the opportunity I had to prove I had to prove every step of the way mm -hmm. and that, you know, you have to have grit and guts to survive. That's yes. Yes. Good lessons for, for, for everyone. But we're especially grateful that you were willing to work hard and prove and overcome those initial obstacles and, and grateful mm -hmm. that those, those things, those paths are, are more clear now than they have mm -hmm. been. Clear and I'm more accepting. People mm -hmm. accept you for what you can give, not what they have a notion that what you ought to be giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, Jose, yes. what has your experience been, been like? Or let's go back to uh, your experience at Juilliard when you first came to the United States. Uh, what yes. were the expectations for you? Uh, but I came to the Juilliard School around the 70s and 80s. And by that time, my main teacher, Adele Marcus, uh, had great expectations for me and of me. Um, she said, you know, you can become a very great, great first Puerto Rican pianist. <laughs> she used to say that all the time. And um, I said, but Ms. Marcus, there's somebody else before Jesus Maria San Román. Well, he's very good, but you can be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she immediately picked me up for uh, uh, Baldwin. Unfortunately, at that time, was, uh, she was an artist in the Baldwin roster. And we had a, a session for photos where she was teaching me. And uh, so, you know, she, she wanted to make sure that... Uh, she was a teacher for everybody. Uh, that doesn't sound to be the story of the Julia in the 40s. Uh, there was a Puerto Rican pianist from here uh, of color, and there was a, the famous teacher, I wasn't named uh, uh, names, but that person, he felt that he was treated as a secondary uh, citizen uh, in her class. Um, but by the time I came to Julia, uh, there has been a lot of progress in that sense. People warn me here in Puerto Rico, be careful because the United States is not like here. 
you know, and I remember saying, somebody saying, this is an illness there mm -hmm. to my mother. <clears throat> but thanks God, I did not uh, really uh, ha suffer from, from this discrimination. Maybe the fact that I was Puerto Rican had more to do than the fact that I was mulatto. Uh, Puerto Rican had a bad rap in the 50s and the 60s in New York because of West Side Story and all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, mean, there have been many ugly, uh, they got a, they got a t the derogative uh, phrases and, and adjectives put to, to the whole population. Uh, because this is the nature of human, you know, you cannot say like all the, the, all this g group is bad, that group, no, they're good people and they're bad people in every group, you know, and every color. So um, that may be a little, it was a subtle thing that I was from the island of Puerto Rico. And also, of course, even today, uh, I find this stereotype that like Maline, Maline said that we cannot play Bach, Bach Beethoven and Chopin like the Euro, uh, you know, or the Russians or whatever you want to call them, uh, the European artist. And this is not true. This is not true. The boundaries have been broken. And I think by now we're beginning to realize that yes, we can play it as well. And the Latino population is beginning to really take hold and be recognized as a talented group too. And, um, and for example, um, you know, my teachers, uh, all of them started in Europe. Uh, Adele started with Joseph Levin, who's the ultimate Russian school piano, the real Russian school. So she taught it that tradition. So my plane is geared toward that. Uh, also, Schnabel, the intellectual part of the music or the, the musicianship of Schnabel, also I got a lot of that. The, my teachers here in Puerto Rico study with Alecol Normal, with Alfred Cortot, and uh, people like that. So that was another influence that I had. Uh, so if you tell me, oh, well, you know, in, in certain country we play like this. And I say, look, I know how it's played. I don't care what country you come from. <laughs> because I have had this training too, coming from a different uh, plane and, and a really top train. I, I mean, looking back, I've been so, so fortunate. Uh, yes, indeed, the only pianist who had that luck was Van Roma in his old days. But aside from that, I've been very, very, very lucky. Um, there has been instances, I must say, that uh, after, mostly after I graduated from Julia. In Julia, I really did not feel this. But after, in the managerial world, uh, I think we were talking the other day, that I want names, but I don't want na name names. But there was somebody, one of my teachers had an influential position with the owner of one of the great orchestras of the United States. And uh, she recommended me and somebody else who was from Asia. And his response it was, well, I'm interested in here the Asian. I'm not interested in the here in the Puerto Rican. I don't like those people. Wow. Yeah, it's, it, it's unbelievable when we hear those things now. And, and, and we seem to be shocked. But yet, I think mm -hmm. there's still some pervasive yes. uh, elements of that that uh, people from certain countries or people who look a certain way are more naturally attuned to certain repertoire and they can't play other repertoire. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. and, and what you're telling us is that you had hope early that people believed that you could play everything. Right. And right. as long as you got good training from right. the right places. Right. Uh, so, and, yeah, and can... of course, the problem with America you see, when I go to Europe, I don't, I, in Europe, I have never felt that way. I, I'm very, very exotic, but my background where I come from has not been a, a determined factor in categorizing my artistry and my pianism. 
Mm. Uh, there, I never felt that way. But in the United States, you have people from Eastern Europe, from Western Europe, from Asia, and we are all competing, I guess, in the same pot. So everybody says, mm -hmm. oh, I am the owner of this. Oh, I'm the owner. You know, so it gets, I find it here more complicated. The music in, <clears throat> in the United States <clears throat> is much more competitive. I yes. think that, yeah, is a, <clears throat> it's not music so much as a success that, yeah. that, is, that is recognized in the United States. Exactly. And uh, I discovered that when I first came from mm -hmm. over Europe, because I played mostly in Europe. And when I went to discover managements in New York, for which I had introductions and so on, the first management asked me, are you any good? And I said, have you read my resume? Have you read my reviews? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, but are you any good? And I said, well, I guess I'm not too bad because I was brought up in a culture that said, don't tr blow your own trumpet. <clears throat> and then he said, well, we don't take people who are not sure of themselves. I went to the next management and behold, they asked me the same question. Are you any good? And I said, I was the best. He said, you're on. <laughs> you're on. And I was on. And, yeah. and I realized this. Somebody told me about this. I, I was the featured pianist for Human Rights Day concert on ni in the 1970. Joan Fontaine, the film star, read the preamble. And the orchestra was Duke Ellington and his orchestra, a wonderful man. And he and I shared the dressing room together. And, and he and I were talking about this just like that. And he said, yeah, then you have to say you're the best because they take you at your word. <laughs> my manager Herbert Barrett believed in me t totally he took me out of Julia just like that and I, all of a sudden I find myself next to Marta Argerich and Susan Starr and all these established great pianists and so you know but when he tried to sell me that was the, sometimes the, the difficult part but I must say something very strange. My career with him started in the South and I, I never had any problems there. No, I never had any problems in the South either. They were just opening up because I was here in the 50s in Washington when I first started to play and there was segregation in Washington. Oh, yes. I have been directed from the front of the tram to the middle of the tram wow. and I have also been refused water from the front of the restaurant. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm quite used to it, but you know, I take it as just uh, the stupidity of people, the ignorance of people. Ignorance. And I just, yeah. there's no time in life to be too angry. Just get along with it and go on and show, yeah, exactly. show it was so much better. I did uh, a program for ITV in London a series of programs on music as an international language and uh, <clears throat> it was very popular <clears throat> and uh, the <clears throat> I featured music from all over the world. Israel was just opening up and there were composers at that time composing in Israel with Palestinian themes and Palestinian uh, music that was from Palestine. I played a lot of that and I played music from all over and I gave talks on music as an international language because I said that this was the one language. This was a time, if you remember, when they were trying to have Esperanto mm -hmm. in, um, probably are too young to remember, they were trying to have a universal language in the world. And I said that the universal language was music. Mm -hmm. I could go for anywhere without knowledge of the language. I could speak to people and they would understand me. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, was, it was great fun, you know, and um, I, th I think uh, that Human Rights Day concert with Duke Ellington is a yeah. wonderful, I am so glad I had the opportunity of sit, uh, to sit half an hour and chatter to him, you know, and he treated me like a little child. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. You, you certainly had some great experiences that have allowed you to be a trailblazer in your field. Uh, uh, David, you've talked a little bit about uh, the importance of having a presence. So as we move from the things that have been done in the past to influencing 
our future generations, uh, you have a, a leadership role now, certainly at your university, but what kinds of things have you done to show other, other kids and people who are watching you and to just have a presence in your world? Yeah, well, uh, the first thing I, I want to say is thank you uh, to Jose and Malani, um, you know, the, the people of your generation and uh, pianists like you uh, have made possible uh, pathways for people of my generation. So um, to hear all of the things that you've gone through uh, to get to where you are um, is extraordinary. Um, some, some things that stuck out of, about that to me is the word uh, you use, Malini, impediment. Um, you know, a, a lot of times I think in the classical music world as um, musicians of color, we don't see many of us um, uh, regularly. I mean, there are certain places where we can gather, but in sort of everyday experience, you might be one of, one of uh, two or, or, or by yourself in your everyday world. And for students growing up, you, you, the only access you have are, is maybe to the uh, really, really uh, famous uh, greats. Maybe those are the only ones you know, but it's not your local teacher most of the time. Um, and I think something to remember about that is um, just the, the, you know, they really are great, exceptional human beings. That's not the path for everyone um, to be able to uh, overcome all of those things is more than just talent and hard work. And, um, you know, we sometimes can um, glamorize it as it creates grit and it, it certainly does, but uh, the impediment for some people is too much to overcome and that's a talent we've lost from the world um, if they haven't. So, I, you know, something I think about as a, um, someone in an administrative role and as a musician, is how do we um, not only see the exceptional people who have come through, but how do we um, open the, the pathway um, for uh, everyone to be able to have a chance for their talent uh, to flourish? <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I think uh, I've, during this whole pandemic, I've been spending a lot of time in, uh, outdoors in my yard <laughs> trying to keep it managed um, and it makes one think a lot. Now I know why Beethoven loves so much spending time uh, out in, the, in nature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it helps think as a musician. Um, and I've been thinking about this and how do you grow musicians? Um, uh, we talk about it as a path, as a road a lot of times, the journey on a road. But if you think of it in terms of organic life, um, flowers uh, or something like that, um, and th think in terms of growth, um, most of the times we don't grow um, flowers organically in a vacuum, it's in an ecosystem. Um, and an ecosystem requires uh, lots of other things um, in addition to uh, the will or the, the uh, power of the seed itself, right? Um, it, to grow a professional musician, just think of all the things that go into it. Talent and hard work are certainly um, uh, at the forefront of that. Um, but then there's also um, what opportunities you've had to attend recitals um, of, of musicians and learn that way. Um, what opportunities you've had to perform. Um, have you had the opportunity to sort of understand the culture of classical music? Um, you know, mm -hmm. practicing at a piano all day doesn't make you ne necessarily understand those aspects. Yeah. Um, do you have the attire, recital attire, I mean, to perform? Do you have access to an instrument? All of those things um, make a difference uh, and none of them relate to talent and hard work. Um, and so if you take, go back a level for some of those things, well, where do those opportunities come from? Um, and, you know, a lot of them uh, come from other people uh, in your life. And um, it depends on your circumstance. You may have um, a parent or someone who can um, give you access to all of those pathways. I think oftentimes um, for a musician of color, at least in my experience, um, the, the sort of all of those elements of the ecosystem uh, that we typically think of that makes a professional musician um, might not be the pathways we have access to. Um, and so where do you get them? I know for me- um, I, I, it, it didn't happen to me. 
I was born very poor. Mm -hmm. I've grown up without plumbing, without electricity, without radio, without light, with uh, bathing at a village well. And that's how I grew up. I, but that was one big thing that the British colonialists did. And that is they had competitions, music competitions. And my mother was a music teacher mm -hmm. who uh, taught. She got one dollar a month for two lessons a week, half an hour. And her ambition was only that I would get more than one dollar a month for two lessons, two half hour lessons. Mm -hmm. I uh, had a very good music teacher. I called Miss Alex Coburn. I can weep when I think of her. Mm -hmm. At the age of 12, I, I took music examinations every year, twice a year. And all my mother said was, you have to prove that you're good. You have to prove. You have no option, you have to prove. And my mother's favorite phrase was, don't let the grass grow under your feet. I used to think, what kind of grass is this that grows under my feet so rapidly? My music teacher at the age of 12 arranged a concert and, and got a lot of publicity. And at that point, um, when I was a little over one year later, I did not get a scholarship. I got a scholarship from the Royal College of Music, but no money to go there no money to live in London. I, my father took me to the newspaper, the Times of Ceylon, to ask them whether they would give a write-up, a small write line about me. And they, the editor there, the assistant editor said, wait a minute, he went in, spoke to his editor, came out and said, tomorrow we open a public fund. For the first time and the only time in the history of Sri Lanka, has somebody been taken and has a newspaper opened a fund, a scholarship fund. School children gave 50 cents. People gave more money. And as they grew, they gave more and more money and they started competing to give me money. I had so much money. The government then decided to chip in and then they decided to vote a scholarship. And then my father was given a job in London. And so we went to London and lived there. Oh. That's, that's wonderful. It's God great to- in a miraculous way. And I am so grateful to so many people who helped me that way. Small children, I meet them now, the great grandchildren of those people. So my mother gave 50 cents. That was her touch of money. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, what a great way for a community to come together. Uh, David, I loved you. And yeah. Was, no so, uh, racial divide at all. We were yeah. uh, English, uh, Tamil, Sinhalese, whatnot. They all contributed, and I'm grateful to all of them. That's wonderful. Interest. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great for a community to come together and support in that way. And certainly you were someone who had great strength of character. Um, but oh David, God. I love that, that, that you pointed out that it, it takes more than just a strong seed, that the seed has to grow somewhere, that it can't grow in a vacuum. What, what are some of those elements? Um, what, what would you call the, the fertilizer and the sun and the water and the good soil? What are some of those elements that, that we can provide to make sure that others get the kinds of opportunities that Milani was able to create for herself? Just I didn't create for myself. My mother was another. A like yeah. a dandelion grows even, even when you cut it. It <laughs> keep growing. Good. You can yeah. as many dandelions as you want, and they only grow faster. And he said, you have no option. You yeah, really that's... have no option, she told me. You get up, if you fall, you get up and go. And yeah. that was my mother's theory. And I, I just thank her that there were many times when I wanted to give up the whole thing. And why, why do I want to try? said that you have no option. That's all that's that is. Have no, yeah. I'm an only child. So that's, <laughs> that's great. what yeah. it is. And That's I great. think all people need a mentor. Yes, yes. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. They need a mentor with belief in them. That's to say, right. go, boy or girl, and do what you have to do. Show right. them who can. That's Never right. mind, don't waste time complaining even. Just show them. You yeah. are better, not just equal, but better. So, David, how can we match up those mentors with the kids who need the opportunities the most? Yeah, I think um, it's not necessarily the, um, the things that are needed to become a professional musician, 
or music um, or someone who's involved in music that are different, <laughs> it's the on ramps for the uh, to those things. Um, and I think um, in in many cases you can think of it. Um, at a personal level, and you should for your students. And those aren't just things that go for, you know, students of color. There are things that'll make you a better mentor for anyone. But in the cases of your students of, of, of color, understanding some of these um, issues um, at the systemic level of all of these things that go into making a professional musician um, is important. Um, I think um, in order to create mentors, it starts at the level of education. Um, for students to be able to see um, performers who look like them and see that this is a space for them, a career for them. Um, I, for me personally, anytime a, a school, um, no matter what grade level or, or anything, wants me, uh, a, a musician to come, I'll go there um, and make a point of it myself so that they um, see me and, and, and have the chance to uh, see that that's out there. I think um, in our programs, um, in order for those opportunities to exist, it starts at the administrative level. So um, certainly in the case of students of color, there may be additional um, obstacles to overcome in under sort of the, the cultural aspect. Uh, Malani, when you said you, um, in your culture, were sort of taught to not um, blow your trumpet. And then in order to get to New York, you had to change something that you learned is, um, you know, something that uh, I think a lot of students of color coming into classical music have to think about is um, how can, how does your culture mesh with sort of this world? And um, that continues to be a struggle. But when you have um, musicians of color that you can see and ask those questions and mentor, um, that helps. So sort of uh, access to that. But I think for any teacher, um, being willing to uh, un acknowledge these issues and understand them and then think about for your personal that student what can you do is it is it are there financial issues are there issues of um seeing concerts are there anything like that in addition to the teaching and i think um it's just so essential and that will you know for any musician to grow to have access to those those I've, I've always told my students my, my students realize i have very few students I'm 91. I only teach five at the moment from GW. And they call me during this pandemic, irrespective of the, of the day that they have a lesson or not. I know their problems, their difficulties, everything about them. And, and I have said, you know, I will fight as long as you will fight. We will fight together and we will win because there's no option. Yeah. Right. I must say, I must point out some phenomenon that happened when I was growing up. And um, again, this is, it's, well, it's part of the irony of, of this whole uh, music uh, business, classical music business. When I was growing up, um, there was a great inspiration in Andrew Watts. Yes. Andrew Watts became perhaps the most sought out and most important American pianist. Yeah. People like Martha <laughs> Argerich, uh, Maurizio Polini, had a great admiration from Andrew Watts. And that was, as I said, a great inspiration for all of us who were uh, people of color. And uh, my mother, my aunt, my family pointed that out to me. And even my teachers, when I came to the Julia, you know, they always talk about the phenomenon of Andrew Watts. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore. And there's a lack of role model in that sense um, that I think there's a void there that is, is, is happening. Well, I think the talent is there. I, I, I mean, I talent think is there. Is yes, talent is Absolutely. there. Absolutely. But I, I think it's it's a conversation that needs to be present always. That always. it needs to be all of us speaking up for creating diversity in these fields and for looking mm -hmm. for ways to mentor and give opportunities. Paul, you've had an opportunity to to be a great mentor to many kids. Um, but who were your role models growing up? You were, you're a very successful jazz musician now. Um, did you have teachers who looked like you? We assume that since, since the jazz world seems to look like a pretty uh, comfortable place for people of color, how did that play out in your experience? 
Um, for me, um, the, the the jazz piece happened a little bit later. You know, like like many of us, piano lessons kind of looked the same for everybody. I think um, yeah, for me, what was important was that my teacher did become a mentor to me. And although she was a, um, a white lady, uh, you know, we would go to concerts and the, often the concerts were people of color uh, that were playing on the stage. And so for me, that was um, some of the first non, non-pop music examples for me of, of musicians playing this instrument and other instruments at a very high level. But to be honest, it wasn't until I got to grad school that I actually had professors um, of any professors of any um, subject, point blank, uh, that that were a person of color. You know, wow. and so it doesn't. It's not necessarily, I guess, for me that um, they made me feel different or that it was an other or something like that. But I think for me, what it was, was being proud of the heritage that you do come from. And although they never spoke bad about, you know, the heritage that you come from, there wasn't that emphasis on, you know, what you and your people um, and our experiences bring to the table are just as important. You know, it wasn't that cursory, well, these were the bad things that happened. It's like, these are our influences and these are our positions and our people that made a difference. And you should be proud of them like, you know, people are proud of Bach and Beethoven. And so that was kind of the experience for me that kind of flipped the switch. It's like, man, if, if, if more students had that earlier, then that might be helpful in breaking the barrier because we all go through that age where um, you're in middle school and now it's maybe not as cool to play an instrument as it once was. But if you were able to see, here are these people and this is what I'm doing and what I'm doing um, is standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, like the folks on this call, it could be a piece of the puzzle needed to get beyond that, that, that gap that David talked about, so that there are more Jose's, there are more Melanie's, you know? Why do you think those conversations are uncomfortable for us? Why is it hard for us to talk about? I think it's hard for us to talk about because it's hard for us to deal with what it is that has happened, you know what I mean? Um, and as long as it is uncomfortable, I think people will shy away from it from uh, maybe thinking that they'd say the wrong thing or not necessarily knowing what to say. And so they decide, well, I'm just not going to touch that. You know, um, it, could be more, it could be more things than that, but I think those are probably some big pillars. Yeah. I mean, I have to say that each of you to a person has been so gracious with me in helping me figure out how to frame this conversation and how to talk about it appropriately. So I'm really grateful for that. But Paul, you, you said something in our, our conversation about just having grace on all sides and be, being forgiving for maybe some of our missteps and all of us having, having grace in just being willing to have the conversation. How has that affected the way that you talk about things? Um, I think that for me, there have been a lot of instances where, you know, like all of us, we are the one dark, dark spot in a very light room. And, um, you know, folks will say something or assume that we are all the same. You know what I mean? And so, you have to you have to teach them that one no we are not all the same and don't expect that experience to be the experience that you get from somebody else but then also um that you need to you need to have these conversations because if you don't have these conversations you will grow 
another generation of people that don't want to have these conversations. And I think the further away we get from the source, the harder or the easier it is for folks that don't want to have the conversation to say that it's too old. And once once we get there, then we can't get to the root of what this is and start to work through it. Because without, um, without recognition of where we are and how we got here, I think it's hard for us to move forward. You know, Think about when you teach your children. If they get into a fight and somebody hits somebody or they pull their hair, the first thing you start with is, I'm sorry. And then you move towards restitution. But I think that for us as Americans, it's hard for us to deal with that, that first part of it because you know, we may or may not be connected to somebody who did that or we came second gen, you know. But like David was saying, there are pieces throughout this history that advantage some and advantage others. And it doesn't make you a bad person, but we need to start with this is the situation. Let's, let's talk and deal with it. Yeah. I think, you know, I think, you know, uh, looking back, I think uh, you have to have somebody in your life <clears throat> who gives you the feeling that you are special as you are. Vive la difference, as the, France, as the French would say. The difference is what makes you special. And the idea, I find this idea of um, separation is, was far greater when I came to Europe, uh, to, to America, than when I was in Europe. I, uh, but then my parents, my mother was living and she was with me uh, at that time. And if anything came, she said, be happy, you can. You are the, you're different, that's all, you're different. And you are just as good, but different. And I think I stress this to every, every colored student, student of color that I have, that, you know, you may look different. That's all that's different. But you can do as much as everybody. And I asked them not only because they come to college. I said, if you are good in piano, it's not only piano that you're good at. How are you doing in your calculus? How are you doing in your English composition? Uh, write me an essay. What, 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 and so I keep on prodding that the whole person is developed and that they develop a character that is resilient. Because I tell them, life has not. Take them, but bounce back like a ball. The ball doesn't stay down unless it has no air. You bounce it, the harder it hits, the higher it goes. That's what you look forward in life to. Yeah. And uh, I must say, my teachers at the Juilliard School, they were always insistent for me to be proud of my heritage as a Puerto Rican. And they, they really, really supported it um, and remind me. And that was one of the last advices I got from Adele Marcus. And when she says, I'm, I'm crazy, I probably will be gone very soon. But I want you to know that you are Puerto Rican and you must be proud of your heritage and you must do something about that. And, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, coming at it from a position of pride and to, to say, yes, yes I'm, I'm proud of, of right. who I am and for all of us to accept and, um, and celebrate those things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, David, you had something to say. Um, sort of going back to what Paul uh, mentioned, um, you know, that there are experiences that um, in classical music, all people of color um, will have, um, such as seeing fewer people who look like you um, in the field than you see of people who don't. Um, I think um, what he mentioned about at the same time, uh, understanding there's those things um, that span a, a, a wide array, uh, but then there's also um, the person that you're dealing with one-on-one um, uh, -on -one or personally who you know and knowing them as a person that those two things have to be held together. I think, um, you know, we were talking about how, how uh, we sort of have conversations like these and, and all of these things and, and sort of the fear of making mistakes. Um, and we will make mistakes and mistakes will be made and, and the grace is important. I think one thing um, to, to make sure we um, think about is that, you know, um, being aware of sort of the larger 
issues that um, musicians of color would face um, help one helps one to be well intentioned. I think um, to know the the person you're dealing with and and holding that with the other uh, thing helps to avoid some of those mistakes, um, such as assumptions. So this was my experience with the last person. So this was the experience with this person. Um, so it's, it's holding both those things. I think, um, I, you know, we learn a lot from music. You can look, look at the data of how studying music helps you develop as an overall person in your education. But I think we think in these ways as musicians, um, locally and long-term, if you're playing a Beethoven sonata, let's say uh, Opus 111, last movement, uh, for those of us who know, or something like that, um, there are moments of beauty in phrases, but if you're preoccupied with every single phrase and don't see the whole structure, then uh, you've lost something uh, in the development of that piece. At the same time, if you only uh, think of the end and don't savor those um, individual special moments, like um, personal moments, then you've lost something too. So we're used to doing that in music. It's just applying that uh, in our relationships with um, people, and especially um, if you're dealing with students of, of, of color, being able to think in both those ways. Or any I'm very fortunate because I had uh, Louis Kentner. I had Lance Dosser in the college, Royal College of Music, but Louis Kentner, uh, you probably remember uh, he married uh, and he, uh, two sisters married to uh, Yehudi Menuhin, was an American violinist of great fame at what and what one point he's dead now. And Yehudi Menuhin and Louis Kentner married two sisters. Well, Louis Kentner was a Hungarian virtuoso. His wife uh, Ilona Kabosch was teaching. Then they divorced. She came to Juilliard. She was teaching at Juilliard. And uh, Louis Kentner became my mentor for 25 years. I went with him on concerts. He took me for vacations because I had no money to go. And I spent Gestad, my summers in Gestad with the Menuhin family. And uh, they, they were playing, they had a trio, Kentner, Menuhin and Casado, a Spanish cellist from Spain. And when they were on tour, I played, I sat in for them for the rehearsals and on the violin because I had studied violin for 25 years with Isolde Mengers. And, um, so it was, uh, uh, I was very grateful to him. Um, he taught me, never, never charged a cent. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I had five lessons a week. Mm -hmm. um, I went in the evening after he finished his work. His mother, his wife gave me dinner. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, he, I played and he, he was criticized. And, it, and uh, my life was so totally involved with, with him and his family. And then when I married, uh, my, my husband also came along. <laughs> and it was uh, uh, having a mentor like him helped me enormously. I went to Hungary yeah. with him. And yes. I think it helps to have somebody who has a belief in you. Right. Yes, said, well, exactly. wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. Concerts, he came yeah. to after the concert in front of all the people. He walked on the stage and said, you are good. I'm so proud of you. And that yes. was, in, I just burst into tears. That's and wonderful then, to have, to have great mentors like that who really believe exactly. in you. Exactly. Yeah. Paul, exactly. you've had the opportunity to work with a, a, a lot of kids and um, have, have learned a lot of things about what it takes to address the whole child and to be able to find some of those things that David talked about that, that might help us better understand, as, as he was saying, the whole Beethoven sonata and not just one passage. How, how has, uh, what have you done to, to provide those things for your students? I think, it, I think it starts where this conversation started, and that is building the relationships. You know, um, you have to be ready to build the relationship and start with the relationship before you can hit on any of the other stuff. And I think um, oftentimes in my uh, areas that I've, had the privilege of working in, you know, there are a lot of well-meaning people that go with the hope to do well. And then they realize that it's a lot and then other priorities happen and then they can maybe, maybe step back. And so, you know, it takes 
as a result, it takes some time to really build a, a serious relationship. And so if you're going to if you're going to step into this arena, I think it's important to remember that. And where maybe it doesn't take as long in some instances or, or some um, socioeconomic circles, uh, you have to, there there is going to be a guard that's up. And so you have to make sure that you are talking, that you are understanding, that you're listening on a lot of different levels at first. And then after that, you can start to deal with the instrument because they know that no matter how hard you are or if you're telling the truth or if they don't like what it is that you've heard or what you're saying, you know, they know that it's coming from a place of grace and a place of love. So it, it creates mentorship and, and um, accountability on both sides, I guess. Um, maybe inspires more accountability on the side of the student. Um, David, what can private teachers do to increase the diversity in their studios to help provide opportunities for uh, kids who may not have them otherwise? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, what's probably the most common case is that if you just take um, on, you advertise that you teach piano lessons and students come to you, um, in most cases it will be the students who are, um, whose families would be most familiar with uh, this type of music already or um, have, the income to be able to uh, afford lessons. So even if you um, have that desire to um, have a studio that's diverse, um, if you didn't do anything, um, more than likely you wouldn't end up with one naturally. And I think sometimes as musicians, we think in terms of this is what the or text says, um, right? There's, um, that's at the end of the day, um, what we're about is uh, the music that is a universal language that speaks to everyone, but there are these, these aspects to it um, that before we even get to the Ur text, um, you already would not have a diverse studio unless you've done something to try. I know um, there's one teacher, I've run the local MTNA group in our chapter, who um, she, she teaches independently and she's made a conscious decision to uh, make space to teach students who can't afford lessons in her studio. Um, obviously that costs the teacher money and time, um, but um, if you teach 11 students who um, don't have that circumstance and take on one who does, um, there are creative ways, especially if you're own, your own boss, to be able to figure out um, how you can do that if you have the desire, and then you can enter into this kind of, of a relationship that that Paul's speaking of, but I think the most important thing is to realize it doesn't often just happen unless um, you sort of pursue these kinds of avenues. But that's one that I think any um, private teacher, uh, independent of a, of a school, university, community school, um, can consider for, for themselves and their students. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Can I add? Um, yeah. One thing that I, I'd say is um, that you have to make sure that you're looking through this and you're viewing through this through an individual lens. And this is something that I think gets caught up in this conversation is that, well, I tried and that person let me down. And I think it's important to remember if you were on a gig and the bass player was Russian and he wasn't that good, you are not you're not disregarding all Russian bass players after that. But I think sometimes in this instance, when we're thinking about, okay, we're trying to reach out and, you know, help and, and deal with this diversity piece, we will write off everyone because of that bad experience. I think it's important to remember to treat every experience individually and make sure you deal with each person on an individual basis. Because Bobby yeah. might let you down, just like, you know, this other person over here might let you down. And so make sure that you, you don't, think through that lens. Yeah, very important, Paul. And um, you had mentioned in one of our earlier conversations that as a board or as a performing arts organization, we shouldn't go, just go out and say, okay, I want to have a person of color here and a person of color there. It's let's look at this whole picture and try to find someone who, who is qualified and who fits the bill and look at that. What, what kinds of other things? Um, what I find too, Melinda, is that with everybody, and I don't care their color, their race, their issues, their 
problem. Sometimes it's the parents, sometimes it's the mother. And uh, we tend to, as Paul was saying, and David too, sir, well, you know, he comes from this type of minority, so they all the same. And that's not true. You have to see sometimes the, the mother, the father would be shy to uh, express the, prop, the financial problem, the struggles they are in. And if we, like in, as a school, because I've always been within the school, probe more into that and, and, and ask how can we help, can we help, how, you know, try to establish a communication with the parents, then we could come to a much better understanding and communication um, with, and, and you know, because we want to help them, he, she or he and the kid. But yeah. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's true. It's very important to find out, you know, if I cannot pay, it's not just because I cannot pay. There must be some reason why I cannot pay. And we have to find out instead of saying, well, when do you think you can pay? No, that's not enough. No, money, I think, is very important in America, which was never very important to me growing up. And I thank God it was never important to any of my teachers because I couldn't afford to pay. But I, would know, I do not know how to meet talented students who want to learn, who can take really hard instruction because I don't suffer slackers. And I will push and push and push who can take the kind of pushing. And I do not care about the money. I'm 91 years old. What will I do with money anyway uh, at, this, at, this age of my, at this stage of my life? You, you know, if I can do something that is positive and you can tell me how, I'd be grateful. Oh, well, that's wonderful. I, I, I love the idea of looking for opportunities um, and uh, also uh, judging on the individual and, and not, not their color or background. Right. But I think it's also important to just come full circle and to recognize that there are still doors that are closed to some students. And there are still opportunities that are more difficult. And of course, we love when we have these powerhouses like Melanie that can break through those barriers. Um, but David, tell us a little bit about um, this project that you began at Eastman, Eastman, the Gateways Music Festival. I think that's just a wonderful vision for us to end with today. Well, yeah, so uh, it, I actually have a, a deep history with it. It's an orchestra. Um, it's a summer festival, really, that celebrates music and musicians of African descent. Um, and it takes place at the Eastman School of Music. And I first got involved um, when I was a student there um, at Eastman. Uh, and I uh, received in my inbox an invitation uh, to play a concerto on youth uh, concerto day. So I played Prokofiev's first concerto. We, we did it um, at that time. Um, we had a couple of different uh, musicians who played, and some of them are now my chamber music partners as professionals who were on that concert that day, also students. Um, and uh, I met um, uh, uh, the person who played with me, uh, the piano, um, was a piano faculty at Howard, Dr. Raymond Jackson, who um, I had never worked with a, a, a teacher of color. And um, he, that experience meant so much to me, just working with him and seeing him. But that festival, um, has been so uh, important in bringing together um, musicians of color to play music of um, uh, composers of African descent. There's so many great composers, William Levy Dawson, William Grant Still, Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, George Walker, James Lee, Jesse Montgomery. I mean, there's, there's so many that we just don't hear um, and have the experience of you're not the only one there. And I think that festival um, has opened huge doors. They've done, uh, they're on performance today all the time. Um, the organizers or, are with the League of American Orchestras leading the way in, in, in these kinds of discussions. Um, but I think it started with uh, the, the founder of that organization, Armenta Hummings, um, wanting to make a difference. So. Mm, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm so grateful to each of you who have contributed to this important conversation today. You have had so many interesting things to say. I'm so inspired by the things that each one of you are doing. And I just want to leave our listeners with knowing that, that it's not enough. 
that we still have a ways to go. And there are things we can do that all of us can do and need to do. And thank you for making this conversation more comfortable for me. I, it, it won't be our last. And thank you for the good work that you've done for all the good things that you are doing. Uh, thanks again to Steinway for being willing to sponsor this. Uh, what, what a great conversation today. I'm so blessed to have each of you with us. Have a thank great you. week. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. thanks.